Hello, my name is Andrew Peel, and welcome to the first development update on Fluid Designer. The main reason why we wanted to create these videos is to help Blender users understand what's possible with the Blender Python API. Now, everyone knows that Blender has very powerful rendering, animating, modeling, and other advanced tools like this, but one of the features that's absolutely amazing is the ability to modify Blender's functionality. And I don't really mean making modifications to the source code. The fact that that's available is great, but Blender's implementation of Python is incredible. You can completely rewrite the UI, you can extend the data structure, you can modify the entire user experience of the application. So in the example of Fluid Designer, we implemented a way to quickly design interior spaces, along with a way to manage and create a library of parametric assets that can be used during the design process. So if you haven't already, you might want to take a look at some of the videos that we created that go into a little bit more detail of the workflow. But in these development updates, we're going to be discussing some of the more technical details of how we developed Fluid Designer. And like the title of this video suggests, in this video, it's all about the UI and the decisions that we made to help make the design process more intuitive. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing that I want to point out is even though we've modified the default layout space of Blender, we haven't removed any of Blender's existing functionality. In fact, if we open up this kind of hidden menu here, we can toggle on all of the default Blender interface elements. And so here we can switch back to default Blender layout and begin working, and that works just fine. Uh, but for right now, let's go ahead and go back to the default Fluid Designer interface and let's toggle this option off. We've also included a couple more uh, development tools here. This option will allow you to debug your Python scripts with Eclipse. And if you develop add-ons for Blender and don't use a debug environment, you're missing out on a part of life. Because being able to set breakpoints and step through your code line by line, being able to inspect variables, all these are incredibly important features, especially if you're new to developing Python scripts for Blender. So I'll post a link to this documentation that I used to set this up, but just know that it's one of the most important steps, especially if you're new to Blender development. Uh, for right now, let's go ahead and toggle this off, and let's just go ahead and talk about why we decided to lay out the interface this way. So since a majority of the workflow was set up to allow users to drag items from their file browser to the 3D viewport, these were the only two spaces that we really needed to have available on the default layout. And so if we take a look at the file browser here, we can extend this panel out to kind of see what libraries we have available by default. And so here right now, we're just looking at the project library so we can see all of the projects that we're working on. And right now we're just in the sample projects directory. And so by default, when you install Fluid Designer, we also install a library that you can begin working with. So you can drag these uh, sample projects to the 3D viewport to open them up so you can get an idea of how a finished scene is created. So that works out pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and hit Control N to reload my startup file here. And next we have the product insert and part libraries. And these were built specifically for Fluid Designer. And all it really is is just basically a group with a different type. So just like Blender implements a lot of different object types, you know, there's meshes, there's curves, there's lights and cameras and different types of things, Blender only implements one type of group. And so we just basically extended that functionality. And each of these groups kind of serve their own purpose. And this is a very big topic, so I'm going to save this for a different video where we go over this whole structure and how they all work together in order to create these cool parametric products. Um, but this is probably where we spent most of our development time, so it really deserves its own video. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit later on. Uh, right now, I just really want to focus on the user interface. Uh, so let's go ahead and see how the actual drag and drop functionality and what UI elements are available when we're working with the um, product libraries. And so here I'll switch over to my frameless cabinets. And so here I have all my different categories for this library. And you can see all the items in this category here. Now if we want to add one to the scene, pretty self-explanatory, we just take this item, drag it into the scene, and here we're given some options. Um, so we can assign it to a wall, we can add this group to the cursor's location, we can replace this group with another group or this product with another product. And so we'll just hit enter, and we can see that that adds this object to our scene. So that works out pretty well. But the majority of the time, you're going to be adding these products to a wall. So let's go ahead and take a look at how that works. We'll just go ahead and delete this object here. And I'm going to go ahead and 
add a wall. So just like Blender, all of the add options are Shift-A, so here's all the different objects that you can add to the scene. Again, you can use these pull-down menus here, and here you can see all the different menus that we have along with the hotkey that um, is available. So we'll go ahead and hit Shift-A, go ahead and draw a wall, we'll accept the defaults here. And you'll notice in Fluid Designer we use these um, dialog boxes quite a bit. And this isn't functionality that we built. This is actually already built into um, Blender. This is just basically invoking the property dialog. So just like when you hit or when you run an operator and you hit F6, it brings up all of the operator's um, properties. Well, this is the same exact thing. We just kind of lay out the menu in a little bit um, better of a way, you know, utilizing these boxes and just trying to present the information a little bit uh, cleaner to the user. So that's all that we're doing. There's nothing really fancy there. Um, there's quite a bit of functionality that we want to add uh, to these uh, dialog boxes. We want to be able to, you know, select these headers and drag these around on the user interface. But right now, the way that it works is actually really well, uh, works really well. So um, just keep in mind that there's nothing really crazy that we did. That's all functionality that Blender already implements. And you just basically call the uh, property dialog from the invoke function of an operator. So nothing too fancy there. Um, but when we drag one of these products, so let's say we're going to add one of these to our wall here. We select um, one of these and drag into our scene. And if we left click on this wall, we get that same sort of, you know, feature to where we're just invoking the property dialog box of this operator. And just so you know, the drag and drop functionality, Blender already implements this within the default code, but we did have to modify it a little bit. And all we did is we basically just extended that functionality into Python. And so ba rather than writing all of this functionality in the source code of Blender, we just allowed, um, when that event fires, that basically determines what needs to happen when you're dragging an image or a blend file or whatever onto the scene, we just kind of hijack that function. And now we can write whatever operate operator we want in Python and then have it be handled in the code. So it just allows a little bit more flexibility with the Python API. But here we can see that we can um, place it on the wall. So we can add it to left, center, right. We can fill the wall with multiple quantities. But let's just go ahead and place a couple of these on the wall here so we can get an idea. Place one on the right. We'll place one of these objects on the center here. And that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Nothing. Um, Nothing really fancy there, um, but I do want to show you some of the tools. So, I mean, this toolbar pretty much acts as, you know, where all of the tools are located. And again, we use these hotkeys in order to open up all of these menus. Um, and one thing that is really important, or at least I think is really important, is that we add icons to all of these menus. Blender doesn't implement this by default, um, mainly because I don't think they um, or there's not enough icons and things like that. And I haven't added any icons. I'm just using all the default ones. And so I am reusing some icons, which can be a little bit confusing, but we are going through and creating more icons, um, you know, for all the different tools that exist inside Blender because having, you know, the name of the oper or the name of the menu or the operation and an icon associated with it really helps you um, visually find these in the interface quite a bit quicker. But here, if we go to the product tools, we can see that we can bump these products around on this wall. And so this new group type implements the ability to kind of detect other groups around it. And so here are the hotkeys available for it. And so here we can um, select one of these products and we can use our arrows to bump these on the wall. We can hold down shift and stretch these. So that works out pretty well. Um, let's go ahead and add just maybe a couple more products. Maybe we'll go to our upper cabinets, add in a two door upper cabinet to the center of this. And then maybe drag this product into the interface, add one to the left here, and one to the right. So that works out pretty well. There's really not a whole lot to that, but it just really helps speed up the workflow and uh, makes it much more intuitive for new users. And like I said before, we're going to be going through the insert and the part libraries in a later video, um, actually going through and creating a custom product from scratch to show you how all of these you know, parts and inserts are kind of nested together to create these cool, complicated parametric parts. Uh, the extrusions is a real um, helpful library here. And if we switch to our crown molding, we can just drag one of these items onto our wall and say that it is crown molding, so it places it in the correct location. And again, since you know we've extended this drag and drop functionality into Python, you know we can just determine what library that we're adding something from, and then determine what basically needs to be run. And so here for the extrusions, you know we're not doing anything too crazy. We're just you know adding a curve to this uh, wall. We are 
appending that profile, and then we're adding that bevel object to this curve. So we get this result. So, you know, it just really helps automate and speed up that process. The material library is pretty self-explanatory. Here we have all the categories of materials that we are going to be using here. So if we go to our paint category, we can find one of these materials and assign it to the wall. Again, we get the same options. We can left click to assign it. We can just hit enter just to add it to the scene. We can do a recursive assignment. I'll talk about this pointer assignment in a later video. This is a really, really powerful feature. Uh, but for right now, we'll just go ahead and left click on this wall and we'll assign that material there. And here, let me go ahead and just add a quick little floor plane here and I'll switch to my hardwood floors and you can just drag one of these into the floor and assign it there. If we want to do the recursive assignment, so here let's go and switch to our wood grain colors. And let's say we wanted to change the materials on these drawer fronts. We can pull this into our scene and we can hit R. And so this will allow us to assign these materials to the object that we have our cursor hovered over. And this is a little bit tedious to do it for large rooms. And so this is what the pointer assignment is referring to, to where you can basically assign a pointer and it will update the entire scene. And I'll, that's a really powerful feature and it's one of my favorites, but I'll show that um, in a later video as well. And then if we want to cancel this command, we can hit escape. So that's pretty cool. Now, if there's a material um, or an object in our scene that has multiple materials applied to it, so here really quick, I'll just select this and I'll go to my options. And here I'll explain this in a little bit, but I just want to open up these doors just so I can see that, you know, I've got this white liner interior. I have this kind of particle board on top and this finished, you know, material here on the sides. Well, when I actually take this material and drag it onto this object, it's saying, hey, well, I found you know five different material slots applied to this one object. What material slots do you want to assign this material to? So I can say, okay, I want my exposed exterior surfaces and um, my exterior edge banding, sure. And so I can say, okay, and you can see it just applies that material to um, those material slots. So that's an incredibly powerful feature, um, and it works really, really well. All right, next we have the object and the group libraries, and these are just the standard objects and groups that Blender implements. And here I just got some of these models off of uh, BlendSwap, and they work, work in the same way. You just drag them into the 3D viewport. You can grab them and then, you know, assign these objects wherever you want to in your scene. So that's pretty self-explanatory and works pretty well. Um, the world libraries, you can kind of think of this as all of the different environments that you can use for lighting. And here we got these off of blendedskies.com and they have a bunch of really, really um, high quality HDR images. And these are just their samples. They have a lot more um, that you can pay for and they're really inexpensive and definitely worth every penny. So definitely check out those. Um, but to demonstrate this here, I'm gonna switch to rendered mode. And if we add in a sun lamp here and we'll just rotate this a bit to shed some light on what we're looking at here. If we just drag one of these into our viewport, we can see it will add that HDR image to our scene. And so now we can orbit around and we can see how these objects would be lit in this environment. So it's really, really powerful functionality. So let's go ahead and try another one here. Go and just drag this one into our viewport. And so you can see that you can get some really cool results and some really accurate lighting using these HDR images. So that about does it for all of the drag and drop functionality and how this works with the interface. The last thing that I want to cover is going to be how we access all the properties. And that's all done from the 3D viewport. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to maximize my viewport. And let's go and take a look at how we can uh, modify some of the properties of our scene and objects. So here on the left-hand side, where would typically be the tools panel, we have all of the global properties, basically. So here we can see all of the scenes that we have in our file, along with some common properties that we might need to adjust. We can see all of the worlds that we have, along with you know some additional properties that we can modify. Here we can see all of the materials in our scene. So this is pretty cool to have just this one location where we can see every material. We can clear unused ones if we want. We can even clear them all out of here. And since we have all of these assigned to pointers, we can reassign them back to these objects. So we're actually storing what material was assigned when you either use a drag and drop or use the pointer system. So that's why all of these base cabinets got replaced or set back to their default material just because that's the pointer that's assigned to those materials. And again, I'll be going over that in detail 
later on. Um, here we also have just some common properties that you might need to adjust, you know, rather than switching your space, going into the node editor, finding that texture mapping node and modifying those properties. Um, we just figured, hey, why not just, you know, the things that are going to be commonly adjusted, we'll just throw on this interface as well. And so you can, you know, adjust your scale if you want to uh, right from here. So that works out pretty well. And then the libraries panel, again, this is kind of a whole new data structure that uh, Fluid Designer implemented that allows you to maintain these pointers and maintain your libraries. This might look a little bit complicated, and this really deserves its own video. Um, so we'll be making some more information on how this all works here very shortly. So that's pretty much what we did with the tools panel. Um, here on the right hand side we have the selection properties so whatever you have selected is going to basically show the properties for that object now since this object is part of one of those i guess we can call it a smart group or whatever uh, since it's part of a product it's basically finding that that object is part of those so we can access the properties about the wall which is what this product is assigned to or properties about this product so we can see that that's quite cool there um, and again, these are the same properties. So here, if we select one of these products and we right click, we get obviously the same um, properties that we would see in the product panel on the main tab here. So we can modify the location if we want to, we can change the dimension, we can do all sorts of stuff with this product. Um, and we can even see that we have some prompts that we can add. So these are all the custom prompts that as you're designing the library that you're basically giving the designer um, access to. And so, you know, here if we right click and show the main options, we can see that these are all of the same properties that show up inside this list right here. So that works out pretty well. And if we, if we want to, we can add additional ones, you know, to this list. So if we want, we can add a prompt. Uh, let's say it's a checkbox and sure, we'll just leave it at that name. And now we've added this new prompt to this product. And apart from just adding new prompts, I mean, it doesn't really do anything at this point. You would need to assign it to a driver. And again, that's going to be a totally different video that will get into all that. Um, but I just wanted to show you how we can kind of build this dynamic, um, you know, interface just right from within the application. And so we can also, you know, add a new tab. So if I wanted to add Andrew's options, hey, I've already typed that in, it looks like. <laughs> um, we can do that and we can, um, if we right click now, we can see that we have another option that we can select right now. There's no prompts on that tab, but um, it's just kind of a way of categorizing all of these uh, custom properties. So that works out pretty well. Well, we can see also all of the objects that are assigned to this group. And right now there's no meshes or text objects or curves or empties um, just because this product is made out of parts and inserts. And again, this is the whole concept that um, I'm going to go into a lot of detail on in one of the next videos that I create. But you can see that here, these are all of the groups that basically are nested in this product. And by doing this, we can do some really cool things with the drivers and constraints to allow all these objects to kind of work together to make this really cool product. So that's pretty much how um, all of the properties are accessed from the 3D viewport. And um, so far, it seems to be working quite well. So as you can see, there was quite a bit of modifications that were made to Blender to make this workflow possible. But I want to point out that we did almost all of this using the Blender Python API. Now, there were a few modifications that we made to the source, but as long as the core development team allows it, we're going to be implementing all of those features like the drag and drop and a few other changes to the default shipping version of Blender. And we're trying to get that done as soon as possible because we want all of the functionality that Fluid Designer implements to be a Python add-on. That way it can be installed into any version of Blender. Now, we will have Fluid Designer installs available, but that's mainly because we're going to be modifying some of the user preferences, the startup file, and the install is going to come with a sample library. And it looks like we're going to have those available probably right around the official release of Blender 2.7, so it's just around the corner here, so definitely be looking out for that. And we do have all of the scripts hosted on GitHub at the moment, so if you want to take a look and see how we're actually developing this functionality, um, I'll post a link to the repository in the description of this video. But anyway, I hope that you found this video helpful or at least a little bit interesting. Um, if you have any questions or anything, the best way to get a hold of me is on Twitter, um, or you can subscribe to this YouTube channel, and we'll be posting more updates on here soon. So I want to thank everybody for watching, and we'll see you next time.